Everyone knows that our nation, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, is doomed to complete dismantlement. Each year that goes by, foreign meddling is growing bigger and bigger, that even the once weak Prussians are influencing our nation. It has gone so far that our current king, who is supposed to be voted in in an election, only managed to be crowned after Russia put pressure on the same. And with a state of constant war currently won against the Ottomans, where we have failed to win anything useful, our armies in disarray and unable to defend us from partitions. So why hasn't anything been done to fix all these problems? Well, due to our political institutions, mostly the same. While it brings some stability to our nation, the far dominant nobility is using it to stop any reforms proposed by the king. And all it takes is one person who disagrees due to the liberum veto. Everyone has the right to veto. In addition, the nobility are growing stronger each day due to our rural society disabling any other persons from becoming rich. Fortunately, there is one person who seeks reform. Friedrich Augustus, the disputed monarch. But before anything could be done, he travelled to Vienna to sign a peace deal with the Ottomans. Together with the Austrians and Russians, the war went pretty good and we even managed to win the Battle of Vinitsai, getting back the state in the peace deal. Arriving back to Warsaw, our king proclaimed to the same his intentions of reform and reinforcing the Commonwealth. The first question is that of absolutism. All throughout Europe, from France to Russia, the monarchs are taking control for themselves, unlike here in Poland where our monarch is elected and with limited power. Friedrich seeks to follow the trend of Europe and centralize the power around him. However, this seems almost impossible currently. The only way is to start disregarding the nobility and try to drive through reforms without their agreement. One of these reforms is to make the role as King of Poland hereditary. Now the backlash in the same is massive and it won't get voted through but maybe with the royal guard standing beside the nobility they will change their mind. Next, a moderate reform was put forward, seeking to truly reform the political structures of our country and prepare us for the 18th century. This is when we realized that disregarding the nobility wouldn't work. They have grown so strong that it would lead to a civil war. Instead, we will try to cooperate with them. After long debates, our nobles agreed not to veto the bill, but it came with several concessions. Augustus had to denounce absolutism, promising to never take all power for himself. And to keep to his promise, the estates are already being empowered. This allowed the start of cooperation with the nobles, greatly benefiting our nation since they will start focusing on more than just their own business. For example, together it was agreed that Thomas Wojciechowski would be appointed as head of government, a popular figurehead who will help bridge the gap between the king and the nobility. But despite the new corporation, an incredibly strong nobility is still dangerous with no counterweight. And since the king isn't viable, since he has denounced absolutism, the burghers are our only option left. Through foreign investment, mainly from Russia, and the beginning of an economic modernization, the economy will slowly shift towards cities, subsequently strengthening the burghers and creating a rivalry between them and the nobles. Just after this, we received an interesting offer from the Russians, to join them and the Danish in the anti-Swedish coalition. Even though we aren't ready for a war, we decided to join it. The Swedes are our rival and if we win a war against them, it would act as a great strengthening of our status. Back home, the burghers have grown in strength, distracting the nobility away from the king, finally pacifying the same and ending the constant accusations that Frederick Augustus isn't the real king of Poland. This will allow for further big reforms, however not now. Sweden has attacked Denmark, so we must come to the rescue. But as told, we aren't at all ready, which means we must put our time on army reform and rearmament. The army will be reorganized with the focus on infantry. Even though our winged hussars are some of the most feared in Europe, the Swedish Karelian infantry have shown to be the strongest. They are winning almost every battle in Norway. So we will try to copy them and train four new infantry divisions. 
At last, the Russians joined the war and they've even started an offensive into Livland. While we want to help them out, our army is refusing. We will try our best to end these mutinies, but nothing is certain. Stability must be raised. It was achieved by slowly starting to crack down on foreign influence, which had grown unbearably high. But since it costs political power something which we don't have due to strikes among the peasantry, we must focus on other ways ways to get stability. And the best way is to continue our reforms. With the burghers and the clergy growing stronger, we have managed to pressure the nobles to allow both of them into the same, which will give us big bonuses. We also plan to try and abolish the Liberum Veto to end the paralysis in the same. However, news have reached us from the front that our investment into ending the mutinies and the strikes have paid off. In addition, the Russians have entered Ingermanland and have started pushing into Livland as well. This is our chance to reclaim our glory and make the king popular enough to end the Liberum Veto without much discussion. We started our offensive in the east of Livland and by following the Russians. After only a few days they had put Riga under siege and started to try and break through. Together with our protectorate, the Duchy of Kurland, we helped them out. At one point the siege was relieved then close again before they could flee. But despite their brave efforts at defending the city, they couldn't stop its fall. This opened the road to Estonia, and with the Russians having reached the upper Baltic Sea from Ingermanland, it stands encircled. Dorpat was the first city to fall to Russian forces, showing a gap in the Swedish defenses, which our winged SRs utilized to ride north and encircle Narva. Together with the Russians, we began attacks to enter the city at the same time as we moved towards Pernau and Reval. During this offensive, a second peasant revolt started at home, which forced us to spend even more non-existing political power, but didn't stop our offensive. Because with several gaps in the front, the two cities were split and we started destroying the troops in both. The southern was the first to fall, then a rather long siege of Reval followed. But through sheer numbers, the city city was entered and its garrisons captured. So the Swedes have been pushed out of the Baltics, but since they have completely crushed the Danish, the Russians have decided to initiate the process of a peace deal, fearing that the Swedish army will turn east and crush us. And since we have reached our goals, we decided to join the discussions as well. Sadly, nothing can be done to save Denmark-Norway, as Norway has got an annexed and a friendly government imposed on Denmark. But in the Baltics, Kurland got Riga and the Russians got all of Estonia as well as Ingermanland, the reason they wanted to start this conflict. And that was the peace deal. We can now return back home to end the strikes, regain political power and deal with all our other issues. Mainly the growing foreign meddling, mostly from Russia, who if they got the idea to attack us would probably crush us immediately. But first the Liberum Veto will be abolished. With our king popular and the strikes having ended as peace was announced, we could pass the proposition through the same so that the rule that has existed for far too long was at last removed. While the nobles still have a lot of power, the same no longer lies in constant chaos, allowing us to focus on more things, such as foreign affairs paving the way to better dealing with foreign influence and economic investments. On the foreign front, we will deepen our ties with Saxony. All this time, Frederick Augustus has been the king of that state as well, so better cooperation with them will be easier. For example, we will help them to renovate the roads in the countryside. Meanwhile, we will also invest into our own rural economy to make it less so. We will start just like in Saxony, investing into roads all throughout our commonwealth, around Warsaw, in Galicia, Ruthenia and lastly Lithuania. Just as we planned to move to the industry, the Russians attacked Kurland out of nowhere, dragging us into this horrifying war. We will try our best to defend, but with their influence we know there is not much we can do. An army of 40,000 men is being raised in Warsaw, but it'll take time to arrive to the front. Time which the Russians used to arrive to our first and only line of defense, but for some reason they didn't try to break through it. 
This gave us the opportunity to equip our forces with both artillery and howitzers, something we've started producing as our industry grows. In addition, as the 10 divisions were deployed, we decided to commence a daring attack. For some reason, Poskov stands open, so through sheer luck it could be possible that we reach St. Petersburg, the newest Russian city named after their monarch himself and their future capital. With the help of our Kurland ally, we started marching north. One part was sent directly to the city in Novgorod, while the other marched into Estonia. Both met no resistance at first, then the one in Estonia split itself into two groups again, the first which successfully encircled one of the only Russian troops in the area, and the second which moved towards Narva. Sadly, the Russians were somewhat prepared and could stop the Estonian offensive right after we captured Narva, since they had five divisions in the area. However, our St. Petersburg army saw no signs of resistance yet. They first arrived to Novgorod, cutting off supplies from Petersburg, then arrived to the Neva River. This is where we got stopped by the city's garrisons, but by resupplying our forces, then completely encircling the city and crossing the river in the east, our five divisions overwhelmed the Russians and the important city was entered. During this offensive we had also gotten the answer why the Russians hadn't attacked us, their supply issues and the fact that our industry is larger. It might seem strange, but with our high tax burden in combination with our economy reaching its fullest potential with the end of the Liberum Veto and the rise of the burgers, we stand on strong legs. This has led to us having more equipment, which we have started to use to train even more troops to surpass the fielded manpower of the Russians. So, after capturing Estonia and the deployment of the 10 more infantry divisions, we decided to initiate the first big battle in the conflict. The battle for Zaporizhia. After plenty of battles taking us all the way to Moscow, it's not only the Zaporizhian army which have been defeated, but the Russian too, and therefore there are almost no divisions left to fight us. So while we don't plan to annex all of Russia after this surprising victory, we will still march towards the Ural Mountains to absolutely shatter any Russian ideas of vengeance. It was incredibly simple, first Azov and Tsaritsyn fell in the south and we then turned to the center. Here the Russians tried to resist, but despite them succeeding in defending, we could simply march around their forces since we have so much more troops. After about a month we had reached the Ural Mountains and as we entered Perm, Peter I surrendered. In the peace deal we annexed every state from Azov up to Ingermanland, massively expanding our border. Kurland was granted all of Estonia and a Novgorod monarchy was established. Then the rest of Russia was left intact under Peter I. Now that our army no longer is in disarray and our borders are massive, Friedrich Augustus was proclaimed emperor making us an empire and not only a kingdom, which puts us in the same ranks as Spain, France, Austria and Great Britain. During this quite long war, all we did wasn't only warfare. The economy was heavily invested into with better farms and more mines, as well as a new academy opening in Krakow to expand our research capabilities. This all led to our economy no longer being considered as rural, which can also be seen with the weakening of the nobles. 
So with the economic boom, our emperor put even more focus on cracking down on foreign influence. Because even the Russians still have a lot. Fortunately, one of the four nations who is influencing us could already be expelled. The Swedes, or now Scandinavians. While we wait for the influence of the three others to be destroyed, we will prepare ourselves for a big war. The Scandinavians are angry at us and seek to take back Ingermanland. Prussia is expanding and the Austrians have forced Saxony to join the Grand Alliance as well as claimed Galicia. A second thing we'll do and that we've already started to is to integrate our new territories. Poskov was first but as soon as each state reaches 50% collaboration they too will be cored. It wasn't long until the Great War started. It began with the Swedes declaring war but having fortified both Ingermanland and Novgorod we saw no battles. Then Prussia joined the conflict and actually started attacking us dealing a lot of damage. Seeing their chance, the Austrians declared war too, dragging us into the Franco-Austrian war. Since the Prussians are winning many battles and the Austrians might too with their high influence, we immediately started raising 51 infantry divisions. But all this won't be enough right now. If we want to stop the Prussians to break through and destroy us, we must attack them ourselves. The area we decided to do it was in the west of Königsberg, where our winged hussars have been preparing. Using them we counterattacked the Prussian forces and could encircle some in Ermeland, at the same time making our position in Olstyn much more secure. But since the Prussians still continued attacking in the east, we continued our attacks as well, capturing a few more tiles. That was when their offensive finally stopped due to their supply issues, something we will soon take advantage of. During all this not much had happened on the western front. The Austrians were more focused on Tyrol and helping Württemberg so decided to simply defend. The Prussians on the other hand had tried to enter Poznan at first but failed rather quickly. Back to eastern Prussia we launched a two pronged attack to try and encircle several invading forces. While we did advance one province for each attack at first, we failed to close the encirclement and decided to focus smaller, encircling only three divisions. Then we got the idea to encircle all forces at once. Sounds difficult, but by focusing our cavalry along the coast, entering first Königsberg, then Memel by attacking from two sides and lastly Palanga, our Lithuanian port city. As this last part of the coast was captured, maybe more than half of the Austrian armies encircled and with food and equipment running out we could destroy all their divisions. So with Eastern Prussia captured, we will move on to their western territories with the ultimate goal of entering Berlin and capitulating them. With our 51 divisions being deployed, the biggest issue will surely be supply. At least that's what we thought, because as the battles began it took a stupidly long time to advance a single tile. But by carefully choosing our battles and concentrating our forces, we still advanced, soon encircling Kuslin and destroying its Prussian and Austrian defenders. But after that, the Austrians and Prussians had created an almost impenetrable wall, stopping all our attacks. So we decided to focus on Austria instead.
After more than a year of fighting, the Austrian Empire is destroyed. This sent shockwaves throughout Europe. Not only does this mean that the UK stands left alone in the Grand Alliance, but the Prussian wall is no longer secure with our expanded borders. The Prussians reacted heavily to this, declaring a united front against us, the invaders of Germany. With many German states joining them now that the HRE no longer stops them. But this might have been the stupidest decision yet, since they don't have enough money to pay all their new soldiers, most simply went home, allowing us to break through their defenses since they were forced to relocate most of their troops. So we had soon entered Berlin, then Schwerin, forcing them to surrender. And since the Prussians aren't a part of the Franco-Austrian war, a separate peace deal was made where we annexed all of Eastern Prussia and Eastern Western Prussia. Then all the German states were restored, reducing Prussia to a duchy with only Brandenburg left. So with the Prussians destroyed, only the United Kingdom and Scandinavia is left. To deal with Scandinavia we will simply march through Finland, but for Great Britain we will need a navy. Fortunately this is exactly what we have been building. But first Scandinavia. The only issue we faced was supply, but by advancing then building supply hubs we soon reached the outskirts of Helsinki. As we began moving around the city the Swedes asked for a white piece. And not wanting to continue like this all the way to Stockholm we agreed getting only Karelia in the peace deal. So with peace in our north, the UK is the only enemy left which we can focus all our energy on. And that we did, the British naval invasion which had almost reached Paris was promptly crushed, at least in the north. Then using our newly constructed navy and a bit of luck, we landed 43 cavalry divisions in northern Britain and started marching south. Since most of their forces were still in France, we soon broke through and quickly advanced towards London. That's when they finally surrendered, starting a long peace deal. In it we got to establish friendly monarchies in Saxony, Bohemia, Hungary and even Austria, while the French did the same in Great Britain. So finally our nation is in peace and we stand as probably the strongest out of all European nations. And with our strong navy we even have plans to start colonization efforts. Still Frederick Augustus can finally take a deserved pause. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next video.